Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service this morning. I am Chris Static, and I am the Director of Children's Ministry and Volunteer Enhancement. And I'd just like to welcome you to be, that you've come to be with us this morning. Um, some of the things happening in kids is we are making some plans for summer, depending on what we're able to do. We're hoping to start a park day. Uh, where once a week we're going to have kids um, all join together at one of the local parks and do some crafts and have a time to play and just hang out. It's going to be fun. So we're working on that now. That will start when school ends, and I'll get back to you on more details. If you're on my list, then your kids are going to be getting a letter in the mail. should be coming in this week or the beginning of next week, and it's a letter to say hi and it's some activities and some fun things for them to do. And if you're not on my list, then please contact me at children at newlifecallingwood.com and I would be happy to add you to our group. Or you can also be in our Facebook parents group. Um, so come and check it out and uh, join our little community. It's kind of fun. Um, and today, Paul is going to be con continuing his series called Unraveled. So he's going to be uh, speaking today and we're looking forward to that. And we also have a book club starting mid-June and... You're going to be reading selected chapters as we go through. It's by Richard Foster, and the book's called Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. We've done these things before, and uh, they've turned out to be a very enriching and wonderful experience to share together. I think the idea is that you're going to read a chapter weekly, and then you can go through. There's a video that will guide you through the prayer practice. So it's going to be quite a nice way to have our summer, to include that in our summer. Anyway, if you would like to sign up to do that, you can go to newlifecallingwood.com book club. Now, we do have, before Paul comes on for our message, we have a song that we're going to share. This song talks about how God chooses us and welcomes us and has a place for us. We really hope you enjoy this message this morning. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy. Last but he brought me in all oh, his love for me, all oh, his love for me. Through the sunset free, oh, is free.
Hi, New Life family and friends. How are you this morning? Wondering how you're all doing during these crazy new times of the last year and a bit we've been going through. I myself personally can't wait to get back together with people. I am going absolutely stir crazy. I am still working full time throughout the pandemic, which I am absolutely blessed to be able to be still working full time. But after work ends at like five o'clock, I literally go home and do nothing and hang out by myself all the time. I'm so eager to be hitting the golf courses soon now that we're allowed to. Uh, so always looking for someone to hit a few balls with. So if you're a golfer and you ever just want um, a golf buddy for the day, give me a shout because I'd be more than happy to get out of my house and actually communicate with other grown-ups. Uh, something I'm missing very much and I know many of you can probably relate to that. Um, so anyway, I've been asked to give you the reading this week and I am reading from Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 23. So if you would love to open your Bible or your Bible app and read along with me, that would be fabulous. So just get that out now. Again, that is Colossians 2 verses 6 through 23. And that is what I will be reading from this morning. Oh, okay, so here we go. Christ brings real life. You have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord. Now keep on following him. Plant your roots in Christ and let him be the foundation of your life. Be strong in your faith just as you were taught and be grateful. Don't let anyone fool you by using senseless arguments. These arguments may sound wise, but they are only human teachings. They come from the powers of this world and not from Christ. God lives fully in Christ, and you are fully grown because you belong to Christ, who is over every power and authority. Christ has also taken away your selfish desires, just as circumcision removes flesh from the body. And when you were baptized, it was the same as being buried with Christ. Then you were raised to life because you had faith in the power of God who raised Christ from death. You were dead because you were sinful and were not God's people. But God let Christ make you alive when he forgave all our sins. God wiped out the charges that were against us for disobeying the law of Moses. He took them away and nailed them to the cross. There Christ defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners when he celebrated his victory. Don't let anyone tell you what you must eat or drink. Don't let them say you must celebrate the new moon festival, the Sabbath, or any other festival. These things are only a shadow of what was to come, but Christ is real. Don't be cheated by people who make a show of acting humble and who worship angels. They brag about seeing visions, but it is all nonsense because their minds are filled with selfish desires. They are no longer part of Christ, who is the head of the whole body. Christ gives its body, gives the body its strength, and he uses its joints and muscles to hold it together as it grows by the power of God. You died with Christ. Now the forces of the universe don't have any power over you. Why do you live as if you had to obey such rules as don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch this. After these things are used, they are no longer good for anything. So why be bothered with the rules that humans have made up? Obeying these rules may seem to be the smart thing to do. They appear to make you love God more 
and to be very humble and to have control over your body. But they don't really have any power over our desires. And that is the word for this morning. Thank you for reading along with me. Now, let's just take a moment and pray together. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for being able to still have this time together on a Sunday morning and just allow us to read your word, share in your word, and absorb your word. We want to celebrate Jesus as Lord and just be thankful that he did die for us and save us from our sins and that even through these crazy pandemic times we're living through, he is still holding everything together. I want to pray for the plans of new life in being able to start small gatherings this summer so that we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, can start having a little bit more fellowship time together. We hope that uh, we are allowed to do that in a safe manner, even if it's outdoors, just to enjoy each other's company and fresh air and share in your grace together. We pray for our search for a new Maple Lane director. And we pray that you bless Bethany's new path that she has chosen to take and that you find just the right person to fill that job and fill that space and be with the kids at Maple Lane going forward. And we just, again, thank you for our church community that we are allowed to still be here for each other, whether it be part of the care teams or the worship teams or the uh, new support groups. We just love that you've blessed all of us with gifts that we are able to share with each other and that we are still able to be connected as a new life community. All these things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us again today. I want to begin by thanking Christopher for what he shared with us last week as we looked at the end of uh, Colossians chapter 1 into the first uh, few verses of Colossians chapter 2. So here's a question for you. Have you ever considered how architecture reveals the dominant influential power in society at any given time? And it's something that I came across a number of years ago, uh, an article that I read that um, really fascinated me, that you can tell uh, the dominant power in a society by looking at its architecture. So I'm going to give you a few examples here on the screen uh, and use some dates that are really rough, but just kind of to get the point across. So from about 1000 to 1500, 1600, I'm just picking this time frame, uh, one of the dominant architectural structures in culture, at least in the West, were cathedrals. And if you've ever been to a cathedral, they are massive and they tower over the landscape even today. But they were representative of the influential power that the church had over all of society. And I'm not convinced that was actually a good thing. If you look at the history of the church um, through uh, that whole time period, um, there were so many things done that were not reflective of who Christ is. Things that we are still needing to apologize for today. And in that, you know, similar time frame, but, you know, more into the 1500s through to the 1600s, 1700s, you be, you know, and some of it would be sooner, but you begin to look and you see um, the influence of parliament. And so the, some of the dominant buildings, like uh, our parliament buildings in Ottawa, are these massive structures that show the power of the government to influence its people. And then, of course, you come into the Industrial Revolution and through the 1700s and 1800s, you begin to see mills and factories uh, spring up, even through, you know, the 1900s as well. And so factories are, are one of the dominant um, 
driving forces of business and industry and its influence over culture, over society. Also through the 1800s and 1900s, you have universities um, like this one here springing up and they are um, they become and still are uh, very influential in our culture today. The whole idea of education, industry. Um, I'm a child of the 80s. I mean, I, I grew up as a kid in the 70s and then in my teen years through the 80s. And, and one of the, the pieces of architecture that show the influence of the day and age in which I was a teenager were the shopping malls, these huge structures that were um, temples to consumerism. Huge influence on culture and society. Think about the downtown core of most cities and the skyscrapers, these massive buildings, and who owns them are the financial institutions. So here you've got a, a shot of uh, the BMO building. I think this is uh, downtown Toronto. And then think about through the 2000s up to today, which buildings, architecture, reveal the influence over culture? And I want to put this up on the screen for you, a picture of this headquarters, and ask, do you know which headquarters this is? It's the Apple headquarters. It is 2.8 million square feet um, located in California. The complex covers 175 acres. It is a display of power and influence. The Google uh, headquarters similarly covers 2 million square feet, so not quite as big, but just about. And if you remember, Google was trying to buy quite a chunk of uh, waterfront on, down in Toronto um, to build a smart city. And so I, I wanted to walk you through that exercise about power and influence because I wanted to relay that to what we have read here today in Colossians 2, 6 to 23. And thanks to Rudy for, for reading that to us. Because I think Paul is asking the question and, and revealing the idea of fake powers, but hugely influential powers in our world that are that are often pulling us away from keeping Christ in the center as a community. And so, I just want to walk through what Paul writes here that we've read today and, and the logic that he, that he leads these uh, original readers through, which I think is still applicable for us today. And he begins in, in verse 6 just by saying, now that you've accepted Christ, you need to continue to live in him. Some translations say live in him, some say follow him. The actual uh, word can be translated walk in him or walk with him. And there's this wonderful imagery of walking with Jesus in community. And not just you and Jesus, but all of us together with Jesus. And he's in the center. And as a group, as a community, or as a family, we are just walking with him and following where he wants to go. And Paul is saying, when you keep Jesus in the center like this, then you stay strong. In verse 7, your roots go down and you are built up in Christ when you walk with him. So therefore, as you receive Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. And it's this wonderful reminder because he's going to point out how influential the fake powers in our world can be. And that's what he's doing in the very next verse, verse 8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies or high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers that are at work in this world rather than Christ. So Paul is saying, walk with Christ, keep Christ in the center because there are a lot of other influences out there that are tugging at us and, and wanting to pull us away, not only from Christ, but from each other as we walk together in Christ. And, and they are influential. They can sway us. And then in verse 9, one of the, uh, one of the most beautiful verses in Scripture Paul says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Stay close to Christ. Be aware of those fake powers. And understand this. 
everything that you could possibly comprehend about God and more, all of that, all of God lives in Christ in human form. And that is a mind-boggling statement. Like he says in chapter 1, verse 15 that we looked at a couple weeks ago, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. All the fullness of God lives in human form in Jesus Christ. And so our relationship with God is not just grounded in some other place like heaven. Our relationship with God is grounded in His presence here on earth. And that is so cool. And that is so exciting. And I think if I could paraphrase this, I would just say this. God always looks like Jesus. And so if something doesn't smell right or doesn't seem right to you and you're wondering, is this what what God is asking me to do? Compare it to Jesus. Because if you're If you're confused about who God is and what God is like, then understand this. All the fullness of God lives in the human body. God always, always, always looks like Jesus. And Jesus is Lord over those fake powers. So Paul's using this language again. You have died to your old self when you chose Christ. You died to the old self and you've been raised with Christ into this new life. And so Paul's using language around circumcision and it just doesn't, it doesn't translate well for us today um, because that's not really something that we spend a lot of time thinking about today. So the idea is just of you know, something being removed and then there's something new that he's using. And we were raised with Christ. We were dead in our old sinful lives, like the cancer of sin that's been cut away through what Christ has done on the cross that he kind of leads us into in verse 13. And then in verse 14 and 15, he moves on and he says, listen, the charges, all the charges that you think are against you, Christ took those and he got rid of them. He canceled them. On the cross. And for some people, you might think, well, that's those are the charges of God accusing me. And I think when you read this passage, um, that it's appropriate to actually apply that statement in verse 14 that he canceled the record of the charges against us, that that record was actually of these powers, these fake powers, these false gods that are at work in our world. If you think about it, um, the devil, or Satan as he's described, is also described as the accuser. And so if you just automatically assume that God's pointing the finger at you and Jesus, um, Jesus had to go to the cross so that, so that God wouldn't be angry at you anymore, I think there's something to, to just consider here. That God always looks like Jesus. Sin still requires judgment and still has consequences. But the idea of of an angry God wanting to punish you, um, I'm not sure that that really gels with what we see in Jesus. And so the record may actually be the record of these fake powers that are accusing us and always shaming us. And yet what Paul says in verse 15 here is that Jesus takes their strategy, takes it onto himself, and then conquers them through it. So taking all of the accusations on himself, and then he actually undresses them and exposes them and shames them through their own game. And so in verse 15, he says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them. And that's this word actually of undressing them and exposing them. You know, when you, and and he's introducing this idea of these fake powers, and I just think, so, you know, rather than talking about circumcision in this passage, uh, rather than talking about circumcision or whether or not we observe the Sabbath or whether we follow a lunar calendar property, those are issues for the Colossian Christians in this setting. But what about the, the dominant influential powers that are at work in our world today, considering the architecture? And I would suggest here's three that that we need to be aware of, that we also need to realize that Jesus has disarmed them. He's exposed them, he's undressed them, and he has shamed them, and he is Lord over them. So here's three dominant powers that I would suggest are at work in the world today, in our culture. You may or may not agree with me, and that's 
totally all right. And in fact, I would encourage you, if you can think of other ones, and there are, I'm not being exhaustive, but I would say hop on to our New Life uh, online Facebook group and dialogue about that this week and have some conversations about these powers. And I would suggest these three, wealth, power, and individualism. I think these are three fake powers or false gods that are at work in our world that are influencing us every single day, far more than you might even realize or be willing to admit. You know, when it comes to wealth, in in Matthew 7, uh, 24, Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. And he actually, it's, he actually names that fake power or false god. He calls it mammon in some translations. And it's the only false god he gives a name to. And I think we need to pay attention to that. The power of this fake god. And Jesus warns us against the influence of wealth. In Matthew 5, he doesn't say, blessed are the rich or the wealthy, because obviously God favors them because they've worked hard and they've had a good life and they've done all the right things and they've been blessed with wealth. No, Jesus says, blessed are the poor. And he doesn't even say, blessed are those who help the poor. He just says, blessed are the poor. I think that's a a quote from Henry Nguyen. And in verse 17, Paul says, these rules... These powers are only a shadow of the reality yet to come. Christ himself is the real thing. There's a lot about wealth that the message we get is that it would be, it's good to pursue it. If you think about the pandemic, how have people um, coped through the pandemic? They have spent. House sales are through the roof. New car sales are through the roof. You can't get a new boat. You, you can't get a new camper or RV. Um, you can't get pressure-treated lumber because everybody's renovating. Hot tub sales are through the roof. A lot of people and a lot of us in the church have coped through the pandemic through spending because, because of the influence of this fake power in our world that says wealth is going to um, do you good. And it's not to say that all, all money is bad, but I think we make a mistake when we downplay the power of wealth, that it takes us away from Jesus. And Jesus says in Mark 10 that power is used to come under people and serve them rather than to hold it over them and control them. And with individualism, when the self takes precedence over Jesus, then that is individualism. And Paul reminds us in his letter to the Galatians that we have died with Christ. We no longer live, but he lives in us. And so after, after kind of talking about these fake powers, Paul says, so why, if Jesus is Lord over these powers, if he's disarmed them and exposed them and shamed them, then why do we still live as if they have power over us? When we do that, when we follow these messages, then we become like a body without a head. And so he's saying when you listen to the people who push this, and this is in in a kind of a religious context, but Paul says they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. Christ holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it in verse 19. And whenever the, whenever the church puts anything in the center other than Jesus, then we are, we are walking around without our head. And that is not an image we want to give to the world. And there might even be things that, that seem to be good that we end up putting in the center, and they're not, because they're taking us away from Jesus. It might be something like doctrine or theology. It might be ethics or behavior. It might even be the Bible. We put the Bible in the center, but when the Bible's in the center, then that means Jesus isn't. And if Jesus is not in the center, then we're running around with our head cut off, and we are repulsive and frightening to those around us. That's not the image we want. And Paul is saying it doesn't have to be because Christ has beat and conquered those powers. You don't have to listen to them anymore. And he's talking not just to individuals. He's talking to a community of believers together. 
And there's something so powerful in that image. We don't want to look like this picture of a, of a body without a head. We want the head to be there and we want it to be Christ. And Paul just reminds his readers as he finishes off this passage that staying close to Jesus means you don't have to listen to these powers. They don't have to control you. And yet there's, there's intentionality in that. And so there's this wonderful thing of rather than Paul just saying, hey, you need, to, you need to do a better job at trying to trying to not let these things influence you, he just reminds them Christ has already done all the work. And here's the thing. The church's role is not to combat these powers and authorities. The church's role is actually to live in the freedom we have in Christ. And when we do that, we continue to expose these powers and we continue to show the world that they don't have power anymore because Jesus is Lord. So in Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, just pop over here a couple pages, in verse 10, Paul's saying God has made a whole new people out of Jews and Gentiles. In other words, uh, all people groups that are alienated from each other, Jesus brings them back together and makes them one. And in Ephesians 3.10, Paul writes this, God's purpose in doing this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Our role in the church is to live out the freedom we have in Christ. It's already given to us. It's already taken care of. We just need to walk in Christ and to do that together. And when we do that, those powers are exposed because Christ is in the center and he's Lord. He's already defeated them and conquered them. And we don't have to live under that influence. And yet, you and I both know how difficult that is. As I just said, even a lot of Christian people have spent their way through the pandemic hoping that that will numb the pain. But the problem with the fake powers is they always ask for more. They always want more. Jesus is always willing to give more. Grace and mercy and forgiveness and love are never-ending supplies of His, and He comes in person to give it to us. So stay close to Jesus and then you don't have to be influenced by them and listen to those voices. So how do you do that? How do you keep Jesus in the center? I have three suggestions. They might be helpful. You might have other things that you would suggest. Again, jump on our Facebook page this week um, in the online group and have some conversations about that. But I would suggest these three. Prioritize community, prioritize habits, and prioritize others. In prioritizing community, uh, Paul's writing in chapter 2, just a few verses before what we looked at today, and he's just saying, I've agonized for you in the church. It's about, it's about seeking the community of faith and realizing that, that our strength is in Christ when we're together not when we are isolated and by ourselves. That's why we continue to, to stress, um, even though we can't be in large groups, we can meet in twos and threes. And to be intentional about meeting to turn our eyes towards Christ. As we see in chapter 3, which Steve will unpack for us next Sunday, um, set your sights on the realities of heaven. So prioritize community, prioritize habits in... Um, No, I just uh, I think I wrote down the wrong verse. Let me have a look here. No, I didn't. In Colossians 3.10, Paul says, Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know the Creator and become like Him. And so there's this idea of putting on our, our new self. Paul uses this language of putting off, putting on, putting off, putting on. And part of how we do that is by developing habits that keep us focused on Jesus. And so this summer, um, we're, we're running a book club that you could join, and, and it's Richard Foster's book uh, about prayer, and um, that would be a great thing to do. Uh, I'm going to put a link for, we're going to put a link for that. We're going to put a link for uh, the Retreat in Daily Life, which we introduced a couple of summers ago, and I just want to reintroduce you to that. It's a whole booklet around a 28-day experience of all these different spiritual practices that you could try 
to see which ones really work for you to help you keep Jesus in the center. And so that'll be something that I will put in the, the video down below. And then finally, I would just suggest that you prioritize others. In chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, Paul gives this wonderful caption of how we treat one another in community. And, uh, and it's this idea of prioritizing others. Jesus once said, you know, when you go out and you serve the people who are considered least in the world, then you are serving me. And so you'll meet Jesus when you prioritize others and you serve them and you intentionally serve those particularly who need it most. So these are three suggestions that I give you. Prioritize community, prioritize habits, and prioritize others as a way to keep Jesus in the center. If Jesus is Lord, then we don't have to live under the control of the fake powers in our world that are trying to pull us away from him. I hope that's an encouragement for you. And, and I want to pray um, just that, uh, that God would give us the strength to, to receive this and to run with it. So, Father, just as we have uh, sat here today, we want to declare together that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as your people, may we live within the freedom that you've provided for us, Jesus, so that we expose to the world and to ourselves and to those powers that they are conquered and defeated. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus is Lord. And we celebrate that today. Amen. Thanks for joining us. And um, trust that uh, you can jump on our Facebook page, have some interaction there. Click on the links for the resources below. And uh, we'll check in with you again next week. God bless. Bye for now.